This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome you all to the third in this year's 2009 Gifford Lectures. My name is David Ferguson. I'm Professor of Divinity. Our Gifford Lecturer is Professor Diane Eck from Harvard University. The title of her series is The Age of Pluralism. <coughs> the terms of Lord Gifford's remit require each lecturer to give a series of lectures to a public audience, and Professor Eck has been fulfilling that remit admirably with her engaging style of communication. And on behalf of the university, it's a pleasure again to welcome so many visitors from the, the wider public here this evening. Tonight's lecture is entitled The New Cosmopolis, Cities and the Realities of Religious Pluralism. As I invite Professor Eck to address us once more, so I ask you to welcome her in the customary way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ferguson, and it is a delight to see so many of you back for a third lecture on cities. In his book entitled Commonwealth, the economist Jeffrey Sachs speaks of the 21st century as the urban century. For the first time in human history, he writes, most of the world's population will live in urban centers rather than villages from the origin of the species through the birth of agriculture right up to 2007, most people have been residents of rural communities rather than towns and cities. In 2008, the historic and presumably irreversible halfway mark was reached when half the world was urban and half rural." End quote. This trend will no doubt increase and there are benefits of urbanization, so he says, uh, but also a host of challenges. Hunger is urbanized. Job creation is critical. Transportation is sometimes next to impossible. Pollutants are concentrated. And there are unanticipated health challenges. But nowhere among the things urbanized that Sachs investigates are the people. The ethnic and religious communities, their density and proximity, and the challenges it poses for human interrelations in this urban century. I might note here that despite the fact that there is so much new theory about the crisis of cities and the urban future, as with much social theory, it attends little, if at all, to religion. And that is our topic for today. In the past three decades, as I've said, the migration of peoples has changed the religious demography of the world, and with it has created a marbling and interpenetration in cities that is unprecedented in human history. And this is true not only of large cities, but smaller cities as well, like many of the ones that we have studied in the United States. Among them, too, are these new style cosmopolitan cities, world cities. The city its neighborhoods, its surrounding towns, its suburbs, is one of the most important sites of religious encounter, of religious diversity, and of religious pluralism, the engagement of people across lines of difference. The city, writes Lewis Mumford in his now classic study, The, Hit the City in History, the city is energy converted into culture. Since he wrote in 1961, the energies of cities have been fueled and driven by an increasingly diverse population. And these cities are the very places where we find out how to live in a complex multicultural society. At the close of Mumford's study, he sees this on the horizon. He writes, this book opens with a city that was symbolically a world. And it closes with a world that has become, in many practical aspects, a city. What he could only glimpse in the 1960s has become a reality today, 
a multitude of cities that are symbolically the world, and a world that is, in many ways, a city. What is a city? The earliest hieroglyph hieroglyphic symbol of a city was a circle with a cross in it. For the city was the crossroads of commerce, culture, people, and also enclosed, either literally or symbolically. As R.S. Lopez writes, the circle in hieroglyph indicates a moat or a wall. This need not be materially erected so long as it is morally present. It needs to keep citizens together, he goes on, sheltered from the cold, from the wide world, conscious of belonging to a unique team. So a city is not just a giant, sprawling town of indeterminate borders. A center, it needs to have a center. It needs to have an ethos as well. And it is an ordered human habitation. It has some kind of center, perhaps many centers, and it has a boundedness, a sense of boundedness, however large. A city has a self-image, in Mumford's view. It has an idea of itself. So what has happened today with the circle in the crossroads? Is it possible for the complex cities of today to have an idea of themselves? Does the diversity of people threaten the coherence of cities? or amplify its energies? What do religious communities and interfaith communities contribute to the city? These are our kind of questions. If we take the city as the site of interreligious encounter in our time, we recognize that the city is the primary workshop of pluralism. There are new ways in which diverse religious communities inhabit common space, many informal ways in which citizens are ever more aware of the multiple religious lives lived together, lived right next door or across the street. On the bus, one passes the cathedral, the storefront Islamic prayer hall, the new mosque, the small Islamic bookstore. Cities expand our awareness. Cities are also places of isolation and ghettos, places where pieces of a complex mosaic touch but don't overlap or mix. Yet in cities around the world today, there are new spaces, spaces created deliberately, carefully, with creativity and often with difficulty, where people of different religious traditions and faiths come together in a multitude of interfaith and multi-faith initiatives. Our multi-religious future will be worked out here in the city not so much in global conferences or parliaments, but in the common space, increasingly fluid, increasingly complex, that we inhabit together. At the end of the last lecture, I cited Tariq Ramadan as saying, the future of Western societies is now being played out at the local level. It is a matter of great urgency to set in motion the national movements of local initiatives in which women and men of different religious cultures and sensitivities can open new horizons of mutual understanding and shared commitment, horizons of trust. So what's happening in our cities? How is this future being created? My context is largely Boston and the cities of the US, yours, Edinburgh, and the many other cities you know here in the UK. As a scholar of religion, I'm particularly interested in the ways in which communities from around the world put down roots far from their place of birth. How do they come together? How have they represented themselves in new cities and towns where they now dwell? In the US, this often involves eventually building some landmark publicly visible place, these tall tower temples, these huge mosques, beautiful Buddhist centers, that somehow indicate publicly that we are here? And what are some of the ways in which the global conflicts of our world become urbanized half a world away? I'll talk a moment about Israel and Palestine, those conflicts becoming urbanized in the building of a downtown mosque in Boston 
and I'll come to that. What are some of the ways in which people as citizens and as people of faith are finding one another across faith communities in the new world cities? And what are some of the ways in which they've created these new structures of relationship, the very bones of a new city, interfaith relationships, interfaith councils? We know full well that the violence of terrorism has beset some of the world's great cities, New York, London, Madrid, Mumbai, unleashing untold fear and suspicion. And it's important to know as much as we can about the vulnerability of world cities as targets of terror. But if we stop there, we miss the multitude of ways in which these very cities are beginning to claim a new urban form. New York, for example, where the great canyons of Manhattan city streets are also the sites of the Sikh Day Parade every year, of the Muslim Day Parade, of the India Day Parade, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, the Hare Krishna Rat Yatra, the Festival of the Chariots, and where people of every religion and culture died on 9-11, and where the city became a city of makeshift shrines of every faith in the weeks that followed. Or London, a city of more than 600,000 Muslims, 8.5% of the population, where the mayor, now the former mayor, commissioned in 2004 the most extensive study of a city's Muslim population ever to be done in any city, covering everything from an analysis of employment, education, health, well-being, political representation, civic participation, with the stated assumption that, and I quote, Muslim communities in all their diversity play an essential part in the life of our city. Or Madrid, where the city council launched an initiative in 2005 to develop a strategic plan to make Madrid a, quote, city for everybody, a city of neighbors. It was called Madrid's Plan for Social and Intercultural Convivencia, drawing upon the heritage of the convivencia, the living together that had, in Spain's history, marked the high watermark of Christian, Muslim, and Jewish interrelations. Or Mumbai, where the response to the violence and gunfire last December included interfaith vigils, and the resolute insistence that the intended communal fires of violence would not be kindled by terrorism. And they weren't. Let me set our consideration of today's new cosmopolitan urban age in a wider context. I've been thinking about cities for a very long time, beginning with my first work on the city of Benares, or Varanasi as it's sometimes called, in India. It was the first city I'd ever lived in when I first went to India as a college student. Having grown up in a mountain valley in Montana, I had never seen or imagined a city like Benares, dense, teeming with life and with death, layered with the history of nearly 3,000 years. And I discovered over many years of studying this city the ways in which, for Hindus, it was a spiritual microcosm of the whole of India in its classic sense, a cosmopolis, a world city, in its own world and in its own time, a city that gathered to itself the symbolic resources of the whole of Hindu India and came to represent that world, human and divine, within a circle, a mandala, which was enclosed by a symbolic perimeter of guardian shrines that would take a five-day pilgrimage to circumambulate. All the rivers and the sacred shrines of the rest of India were condensed here in this microcosm. It was seen as a city at the center of the world, a city where Lord Shiva's shaft of light linked heaven and earth, an eternal city, not subject to the vicissitudes of history, a city of the good life and also of the good death. Eventually, I wrote my first book, Benares City of Light, about that city. In their classic study of cities, Milton Singer and Robert Redfield describe some cities as orthogenetic, those that seem to condense and represent a whole culture and the values of a whole civilization, those that create and sustain the ethos of a whole society. 
And in, in its heyday, Benares was certainly that kind of orthogenetic city. We can think of others, cities whose very names become virtually synonymous with the cultures they represent. Rome, Kyoto, Beijing, the ancient Peking, the subject of Paul Wheatley's famous book, The Pivot of the Four Quarters. We might ask whether or not in today's world we know any such orthogenetic cities that generate and represent an entire moral order. Now, on the other hand, there are, as Singer and Redfield uh, wrote, equally generative cities that don't give expression to orthodoxies or order, perhaps because complex cultures have no one orthodoxy. These cities they describe as heterogenetic because they reveal the tensions and conflicts of a society. They gather up the complexity and divergence of culture, not always in harmony, sometimes in conflict. These cities make visible the fault lines of a culture, where its revolutions begin, the stretching marks where a society is giving birth to something new. And so cities of this kind of heterogenetic change are many in the world, certainly New York and Los Angeles, Mumbai and Jakarta, London, Birmingham, even Paris with its circle of suburbs with these large Muslim minority populations. Mumbai, or Bombay as natives continue to insist on calling it, is certainly such a city, condensing the complexity of a whole subcontinent, gathering in migrants from the surrounding villages and from throughout India who constitute a migrant majority of its 18 million people speaking 150 languages. There are no unifying orthodoxies in Mumbai, no cosmic plans, no links to heaven, save maybe the uplinks of the satellite dishes, even in the poorest neighborhoods. A heterogenetic city displays the energies of an industrializing society and the conflicts and tensions of a whole society. And cities like Mumbai Mumbai do just this. They explode with revolutions. As Ramesh Kumar Biswas puts it in his book, Metropolis Now, the 3,000-year-old 3, Varanasi can hardly bear the weight of its architectural jewelry, but Bombay is an Indian version of the Eurovision Song Contest. It has no masterpieces. It is more a laboratory for the fusion of Indian identities. He goes on, Bombay throws its huddled masses into a cauldron and stirs them energetically. They begin to discard traditional dress, loyalties, caste. It's done more to reduce discrimination than all the state's anti-discrimination policies put together. Traditional cities like Benares reproduce cosmological order and make it accessible on the human plane. They become centers of pilgrimage and world ordering rites and the ceremonies of the gods. But Heterogenetic cities like Mumbai are more aptly expressions of the technical order. Their image is one of action. They hum, they produce, they order power, production, and wealth. Their housing projects and slums are as vast as their skyscrapers are tall. Their energy is ambiguous, both attractive and dangerous. Now, no city really fully sums up a culture's orthodoxy or represents its revolutions. Most old and great cities have something of both the orthogenetic and the heterogenetic about them. But it's the moral order of the city that is endangered in the growth of the technical order and that is compelling to Mumford and to my work as well. As Mumford looks back on the city in history, he also looks forward to its future and its prospects. He didn't use the term globalization, but he saw on the horizon of his time that the resources and power formerly concentrated in the city are becoming diffused and articulated into a vast metropolitan area and beyond that into a worldwide system. He wanted to explore the human functions and the purposes of the city so that, as he put it, we might lay the foundations, a new foundation for urban life in a world that requires a new kind of world city to survive. He writes, the mixture of divinity, power, and personality that brought the ancient city into existence must be weighed out anew in terms of the ideology and culture of our own time. 
and poured into fresh civic, regional, and planetary molds. So our question is, is there any hope for new forms of bonding and bridging and belonging in the great workshop of today's cities? Is it possible for our cities to have an idea of themselves or to create, in Mumford's words, fresh civic, regional, and planetary molds? Today we do have a new kind of cosmopolis, a world city, but of a very different and more complex world than that represented by Benares or Beijing. The cosmos itself has changed. It has become global in imaginative reach and multicultural in reality. Consider London or Singapore or Edinburgh or Amsterdam or Detroit, Bangalore in Karnataka or Fremont in California. These new cosmopolitan centers are world cities that increasingly display the complexity, the heterogeneity, and the diversity of the world. And sometimes this catches everyone by surprise. The capacity of cities to condense, centralize, and assemble culture and power is today matched by this new challenge, the multiplicity of cultures. How do world cities of today assemble and link the multiplicity of cultures and provide space for their interaction and engagement? And what does this kind of city mean for the ongoing study of human religiousness? In addition to bringing cultures together, there are dynamic new patterns of life and commerce that move back and forth, back and forth between cultures, between New York and Mumbai, where people virtually live in both places, between uh, the people who own cleaning companies in Boston and their Brazilian hometowns, where they, again, move back and forth with a kind of bicultural nationality in two cities. Urban scholar Edward Soja in Los Angeles speaks of the impact of globalization as the unbounding of metropolis, both through the, quote, extraordinary expansion of the scale and scope of the modern metropolis and through the dialectics of globalization and localization. The metropolis unbound is a good description of greater Los Angeles, where some 40% of its 9 million residents are foreign born. It is a city with a Latino population so large it is called a Latino subcontinent, and with an Asian population that is a microcosm of all of Asia, with substantial Chinese, Japanese, Cambodian, Korean, Vietnamese subcultures, both Christian and Buddhist, I have actually studied Buddhism in Los Angeles. I was making a film about it at one point and often called that city the most complex Buddhist city in the entire world. The city also has a strong Jewish community, a substantial and vocal black, Christian, and Muslim community, and so many Iranian immigrants live in L.A. that it has been called Irangelus or Terangelus. Like Indra's net of jewels, each is linked, each of these communities, to the other, and the religious communities of Los Angeles are each part of the life of a complex multi-religious cosmopolis. Many of our cities are cosmopolitan in this sense, bringing together people from many parts of the world in dramatic ways and in more modest ways. They do display the tensions and fault lines of the world and are fragmented with the diversities of the world. Marbled as they are with the colors and textures of the whole, they are also the proving ground of the world's promise and future. What are our cities beginning to say about their own identity? The former and controversial mayor of London, again, Ken Livingstone, put it this way. The core of our cultural and social policy for the last eight years has been clear and simple. Whatever our origins, whatever we want to do with our lives, Whatever music we like or whatever we want to eat, we are all Londoners. Whatever our background, old or young, Christian, Hindu, Jew, Muslim, British, Asian, African, male or female, straight or gay, there is a great sense of being Londoners. A single city forged from the immense diversity of its citizens and capable of living at ease despite an environment of change. The multicultural character of London and the multiculturalist policies pursued within it are therefore integrally linked to London's cultural dynamism 
and those who seek to overturn them would destroy the cultural dynamism of the city. It's a tremendous vision for a cosmopolis of today, but Ken Livingston actually said this on the eve of his defeat for his third term as mayor. I don't know enough about that, and some of you can inform me just why that happened. Here in Edinburgh, the city of Edinburgh Council took on the important question of civic equality, regardless of age, race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion. It stated, the city of Edinburgh Council values and celebrates the diverse communities that it serves. And it went on to talk about the proud and rich history that is supported by the Edinburgh Interfaith Association and the aims that that Interfaith Association articulates for the life of the city. What kind of idea of itself does the city have? To improve the breadth and quality of religious and moral education in all schools and their engagement with faith and belief organizations and institutions. To raise awareness of the benefits of interfaith work, promote appreciation of faith and belief diversity. To promote engagement in regeneration and social justice projects in the city by faith and belief groups. To develop and promote an understanding of faith and the resources and community activities of faith communities as social capital. All of this is a hefty agenda for a new cosmopolitan city. And having met yesterday with the general secretary and co-chair of the Interfaith Association, it is clear that it actually translates a lot of this lofty vision into a remarkable set of programs. From three weeks of interfaith education, arts, and spirituality offered during the Festival of Spirituality and Peace in August, to the Edinburgh Interfaith Week during the fall, a monthly interfaith women's group, an evening course on the world's religions, populated to a great extent by police officers, programs on the religions for the public schools, on diversity and belief in the workplace. The organizational structure it has created represents 10 religious traditions of Edinburgh, Christians, Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, and others, and puts in place a network of communication for common work that is absolutely vital for today's city. It's exactly what is meant by what Robert Putnam called bridging capital, that kind of capital, social capital, that is not only the bonding capital that enables people who already know each other to feel stronger together, but bridging capital that enables people of quite different backgrounds to uh, get to know each other. Enzo Pace at the University of Padua looks specifically at religious pluralism in the identity of European cities. And he sees in the city an open social, open air social laboratory, as he puts it, an open air social laboratory in the live experience, experiment of dialogue. Rather than looking at policies from the top down, his researchers are looking at the ways in which cities are dealing with migration, ethnicity, and religious faith. What are some of the best practices actually happening on the local level that have enabled people of different faiths to live together. Pache does not look at Edinburgh, but it would be a great case study for his project. In Britain, he suggests, for example, studying the city of Bradford, where a new teaching religion public project was conceived to enable all people, not just people who go to school, to learn more about other religions. In two small towns in Tuscany, he looks at how civic authorities actively convene locals and migrants for discussion before they make decisions about, for instance, the building of a mosque or a gurdwara. His approach is an important one, studying the open air la laboratories of our cities to see what's actually happening as a way of formulating more ac adequate public policy. In the city studied by the Pluralism Project in the US, there are cosmopolitan centers, large and small, where cities are trying to present themselves, to define themselves in a culture of pluralism. And I'll give you some examples here, because this is part of the research of looking on the ground in Pache style at what is actually happening as cities begin to redefine themselves. In Worcester, Massachusetts, for example, not very far from Boston, a small industrial town, religious communities undertook a two-year citywide process of dialogue culminating in a statement of shared values. And at this point, the mayor sponsored an interfaith citywide breakfast where the statement was read out 
and citizens gathered in circular breakfast tables to discuss it. As members, and this is the statement or part of it, as members of several faith groups of Worcester, Baha'i, Buddhist, Eastern Orthodox, Episcopal, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, Protestant, Quaker, Roman Catholic, we've come together to discuss how we can be of service to our community. With religious faith as our common ground, sustained by prayer and meditation, we engaged in study and discussion over many months. We discovered that the spiritual values that unite us are more significant and empowering and enduring than the differences that divide us. So with courage and optimism, we offer this faith-based statement for discussion and practice by the citizens of Worcester. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole principles that they outlined, but what happened that morning was a discussion of how a statement of shared values should be implemented. Where should it be discussed? Should it be distributed in the schools? What would it mean? And at the breakfast table uh, convened by the mayor, the networking began with serious discussion of what really matters. Houston, Texas, about as far from Massachusetts as you can get, if you know the geography or the sort of general climate of the United States. But even there, Mayor Bill White was instrumental in launching another kind of initiative called the Amazing Faiths Dinner Dialogues. As mayor, he had seen the communities of an increasingly diverse Houston mobilize to respond to Hurricane Katrina in 2006. Yet what seemed to be omnipresent in the news was interreligious violence and tension around the world. Surely there was more to be said than that, he thought, and he himself had seen it. And so the dinner dialogues were launched with the help of the interfaith ministries of Greater Houston. These dinners take place in people's homes across the city. Hosts agree, 20 of them at the outset, to provide a simple, nutritious, vegetarian meal for about 10 to 12 people. Guests can register on the internet, and dialogue guests may attend with one other person. Otherwise, the members of the dinner groups are strangers to one another. Sikh and a Muslim join Christians and a Baha'i in a Jewish home, for example. The dinner table discussion is launched with a stack of cards that ask questions about one's own faith. Each person takes a card in turn. He or she responds not as an expert on his or her own religion, but just as an individual while everyone else listens. Here are some of the questions. Imagine if you got this card. Faith sometimes changes as we grow older. Are you the same spiritual or religious person you were 10 years ago? How have you changed? Where do you see acts of compassion in the world around you? What do you pray for, and how do you understand it if a prayer is not answered? What is the role of faith or spirituality in your life at work? Many faith communities believe there is one message God wants us all to hear. Do you believe that? What is that message from your perspective? Many religions speak of miraculous events that seem outside normal experience. Have you experienced such a miraculous dimension? Today, as in the past, people of faith are persecuted for what they believe. What would you do if your faith were forbidden? A moderator is present to facilitate the discussion, structured in a way that creates a safe space for everyone to share and to listen. In a dinner hosted by a Muslim woman, she said, the most memorable part of the evening for me was when someone talked about the fear they have of Muslims. I've never understood myself that way. But confronting our fears shows us that we begin the process of understanding. Someone else said, it's one thing to read about Islam. It's quite another to sit down to dinner and talk. A Houston researcher studying the project said 57% of the participants had never been involved in any interfaith discussion before. The first round of 20 Houston dinner dialogues was a huge success. People were literally hungry for this kind of sharing. And by the second round of dinners in late November of 2007, there were 73 dinners with nearly 800 people. By the third year, the dinner dialogues had expanded to nine other cities, including Oklahoma City, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Syracuse, New York. Many people continued to meet together informally long after the dialogue event, 
they became participants in other interfaith initiatives, and the threads of connection and friendship made one relationship at a time strengthen the ties between people of different faiths and become part of the fabric of a Texas city. On the whole, interfaith initiatives are not usually connected with city government or with the mayor's office. They're citizen initiated, as diverse as the places they come from. And I'll tell you a few more of them. But this, mind you, is but the tip of a movement that is as wide as the United States and as underreported as such things are the world over. Louisville, Kentucky, a whole city celebrates an annual festival of faiths. Launched in 1996 by citizens of Louisville and supported at first by the Catholic Cathedral, it is now an interfaith major week-long event to highlight and better understand the religious communities of Louisville. It includes citywide events, speakers, dinners, arts performances. Last year, the speaker was a woman named Mary Evelyn Tucker, who has launched a major initiative on the world's religions and ecology. Another year, it might be Geshe Choda, the Golukpa Tibetan teacher from Raleigh, North Carolina. It might be an Israeli-Palestinian youth choir on tour, a Sufi singer in the arts program. The week of program including in includes a passport to understanding, a program that extends that week into a year of visiting one another's places of worship to learn firsthand about religious communities other than their own. People get a passport, and Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Sikh, Buddhist, Baha'i centers will all host visitors during the upcoming year. Chandrika Srinivasan of the Hindu Temple told us that she has experienced positive changes in the Louisville Hindu community because of the festival. I've lived here for 10 years, she said, and people today are more respectful of others because of this event. And the Louisville Festival is also packaged so it is effectively uh, delivered in its approach to other cities as well, and there are about 10 other cities, including Kansas City, Missouri, that have tried it. Kansas City, in its first year, two years ago, capped off its first festival of faiths with a remarkable dramatic ethnography called The Hindu and the Cowboy. Let me tell you about it. After careful interviews with people of faith in Kansas City, the author of this drama composed a play with professional actors taking the role of new immigrants. A Muslim college student talked about what it was like being a Muslim in New York after 9-11. A Holocaust survivor from Poland speaks of the terror of being rounded up and the horror of the concentration camps. She now lives in Kansas City. A Hindu couple from Kansas City tells the story of building the Hindu temple in Shawnee, a suburb. Theirs is the title story. They came often to check on the temple site during construction, especially after the community found a piece of beef nailed to the door of the temple, a deliberate slam against the vegetarian Hindu community in beef country USA in Kansas City. In the following months, that couple came out often late in the afternoon, and they would see a man mounted on a horse riding in the distance. One day, they saw the man nearby. He had dismounted and was picking up what seemed to be trash from the site. They approached, apprehensive, asked him who he was. He said he was a Shawnee Indian, and this land used to be part of Shawnee tribal land. When he found that a Hindu temple was now being built, he wanted to be sure, he said, that the community would be safe and that the same thing would not happen to the Hindus as happened to the native Indians. Last night, he said, someone had come and dumped waste baskets of a local hamburger chain on the property, an overt gesture of disrespect to the Hindus. And he was here now to pick it all up. And so the title, The Hindu and the Cowboy, a drama of diverse religious voices enacted in schools and sanctuaries around that increasingly cosmopolitan city. Syracuse, New York, not a large city, but a cosmopolis in the modest way that many cities are. There, shortly after 9-11, a Presbyterian woman brooded about the rumors that Muslim women were feeling unsafe leaving their home and going to the grocery store. Her name, Betsy Wiggins, decided that something had to be done about it. She started with the Interreligious Council of Central New York in Syracuse, 
then called the local Islamic center and spoke with Danya Wellman, a Muslim woman involved in the center's Muslim women's activities. She invited Danya for coffee in her kitchen. They talked for hours, then each invited nine women for a meeting. Before long, Women Transcending Boundaries was born. The group kept meeting, kept growing, now has more than 200 members. They took hold of critical issues in those months, including the alarming arrests of local Muslims in upstate New York, the impending war in Iraq, and their own life cycle issues of birth and marriage and death. Eventually, they began to look beyond Syracuse and linked their local concerns to those of women around the world, raising money for a school in Pakistan and for a project called Women for Women in Afghanistan. Eighteen months ago, the Pluralism Project convened six such post-9-11 women's interfaith initiatives from around the country to compare notes, to meet each other, and to think about strategies for women's interfaith organizing. Fremont, California, a window on a new kind of American city. It's citizens born in 155 countries speaking 137 language, languages, a city with more sings than Sikhs, uh, more, more sings than Smiths, a city 49.7% Asian, 13.9% Latino. Fremont's India Day Parade attracts tens of thousands of people and the Pluralism Project has recently released a film on this city called Fremont, USA. When our research began in 1993, a Methodist church and an Islamic society had brought adjacent property. They named their frontage road Peace Terrace, broke ground together for a new St. Paul's United Methodist Church and the Islamic Society of the East Bay. And their decade-long history together has helped shape the image of Fremont. When a Sikh Gurdwara was built on Hillside Terrace in the mid-1990s, Sikhs petitioned the city council to rename the street Gurdwara Road. But I can't even pronounce Gurdwara, said a fellow citizen at the town meeting. Well, I can't pronounce Paseo Padre Parkway, encountered a member, encountered a member of the Sikh community. And there they were, uh, glimpsing the reality that in this new cosmopolis, we can't pronounce one another's names and yet we do learn to live together. Civic officials are on the forefront in grappling with this new reality. A Hindu woman has been elected to city council. The mayor of Fremont has made sure that Muslims have prayer space somewhere in city hall for use during town meetings. The Fremont police chief was invited to the Gurdwara and made an honorary Sikh with the presentation of a symbolic sword. Fremont is definitely a city with an idea of itself. In September 2006, this city celebrated its 50-year anniversary. It's a very young city, as you can tell from the antiquity of our perspective here in Edinburgh. It had a public hands-around-the-lake ceremony, ringing a park lake in the city with a human chain of Fremont citizens. But within a few weeks, the celebratory spirit of multiculturalism was shattered when Aliyah Ansari, an Afghan Muslim woman wearing hijab, was shot and killed in a residential area while walking to school to pick up her children, her three-year-old child in tow. The murder was deeply unsettling for a city that had struggled with and steered boldly into its own diversity. And among the many responses to violence, the Fremont citizens or organized a wear hijab or turban day immediately on which hundreds of city citizens wore headgear, whether a headscarf or a turban, in public solidarity with those who are targeted for their visible difference. They had many uh, services. They actually flew to Afghanistan uh, at one point with the husband and the remainder of the children. One of the organizers said, we need to have a visible walk in another person's moccasins event and to walk in another person's headgear. These are not simply assorted facts about a city of 212,000 people, but markers of research agenda. Now in the 21st century, Fremont is Toledo. It is the Toledo of the Convivencia, and what happens in cities like Fremont all over the world is prognostic for the future of pluralism. In developing these ethnographies, we not only look at the development of positive uh, interfaith 
initiatives in cities. But we also look at the collision of local and global realities and the fear and projections that compose the history of religion in our time. The Pluralism Project has worked with Harvard Business School in creating case studies that bring slices of this world of pluralism into the classroom for discussion and role playing. We become mayors and citizens, Christians, Jews, Muslims. And let me give you just two examples of these case studies. One of Boston's most intense lines of tension is the controversy over the building of a new mosque in a large, beautiful, uh, brick New England style with dome and minaret right in the heart of the city. The Cambridge Islamic Society had outgrown its center and the Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center was uh, planned. Almost as soon as the shell of the mosque began to rise, a right-wing media outlet and a Jewish Israeli advocacy organization called the David Project began asking questions about particular past members of the board of the Islamic Society, the sources of its funding, its connection to radical events in the Middle East, statements made by one or another leader said to convey anti-Semitism. The Cambridge Mosque responded to the charges one by one, responded with their posts on their own website. People who knew the Islamic Society as neighbors in its Cambridge home pointed to a long record of civic and educational and interfaith engagement, a community that had patiently hosted hundreds of citizens, an open house in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 as well. The Muslims had envisioned the Islamic Center to be a place of interfaith education. Instead, they found themselves locked in a legal battle with the David Project and eventually exasperated. The Muslim community sued the Jewish advocacy group for conspiracy and defamation. And the Jews had also sued the Islamic Society for, uh, for uh, matters involving the gaining of the property from the city. It was not a great time in Boston with Jews and Muslims engaged in mutual litigation. And eventually, the Center for Public Interfaith Leadership took up the challenge of mediation. The center, located on the campus that houses both a Christian seminary and a Jewish theological school, brings area religious leaders together, and they offered public leadership in this terribly fractious time. Eventually, both the Jewish and Muslim communities dropped their lawsuits, and the Islamic community moved on to complete the mosque. But the scars remain, and the discussion of such a complex case has informed uh, literally dozens of my own students as they wrestle with what is the right thing to do. One last case study, Minneapolis, Minnesota, a workplace study, perhaps the most intimate workplace of all, the taxi cab, where a mountain of complaints had been received by the Metropolitan Airports Commission at Minneapolis St. Paul Airport because Somali taxi drivers were refusing to transport passengers who were carrying alcohol. In the decade between 1990 and 2000, the number of African-born people in Minnesota had grown from 5,000 to 40,000, many of them as refugees from war-torn East Africa, especially Somalia. Nowhere is Mogadishu more evident in Minnesota than at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, where some 75% of the taxicab drivers are Somalis, most of whom are Muslims. It's not easy work, but for refugee immigrants, it's flexible. And if they work long hours, it's a sustainable income. They explained that their faith did not permit them to, consume, to either consume or transport alcohol. They passed on the fare to another taxi if a consumer had a duty-free bag. But strictly speaking, there were hardly any other taxis there. And refusing a fare also mean they had to go to the back of a two to four hour taxi wait line. This imposed an economic hardship. Before long, there was a fatwa that uh, affirmed the deep conflict between Muslim faith and their livelihood and the uh, prohibition against carrying alcohol. The cab drivers asked for some kind of accommodation. After all, they could refuse to allow smoking in the taxi but what about the hardships for the passengers in an airport where three quarters of the taxis were driven by Somalis? What was the airport to do? Was this a workplace issue? 
Was this a civil liberties issue? Was this an issue that uh, involved their First Amendment rights to freedom of religion? Some cast it as an immigration issue that raised the fears of those who were already here about why were there so many foreigners here anyway? There were negotiations, there were discussions, there were meetings, there was even a compromise suggested, suggesting that uh, taxi cabs that observed this uh, no alcohol policy should have a little green top light and would therefore indicate in a seamless way that they uh, were alcohol free cabs. But before long, this local dispute became a national uh, news magnet as a nationally known investigator described this green light solution as having massive implications. Quote, namely, the green light plan intrudes the Sharia or Islamic law with state sanction into a mundane commercial transaction in Minnesota. A government authority thus sanctions a signal as to who and does and who does not follow Islamic law. And what of the slippery slope? Could they then ban women who have exposed arms? Could they ban homosexuals, Hindus, atheists, bartenders, etc.? You can see what kind of discussion issues like these elicit in a classroom, and it's been very interesting to pursue them. To conclude, the logo of the International Metropolis Conference is a huge suspension bridge. Indeed, bridges are the lifelines of a society on the move. In a sense, the health of our cities is measured by the strength of its bridges and the commitment of its bridge builders. It is the traffic, the communication, the spanning of difference that will enable cities to develop a strong ethos of pluralism. In cities around the world, there are new bridges being built deliberately. It's a kind of urban stimulus plan uh, by religious communities, if you will, enabling traffic and contact in the increasingly global city. The creation of interreligious initiatives and networks creates what Robert Putnam calls this bridging capital, the social capital that brings people together across lines of class and religion and race. World cities, whether they're as small as Fremont or as large as London, have become emblematic of the postmodern diversity of our world. At times, they are places of segregation where minorities are marginalized and feel isolated. They can also be places of real intermixing and pluralism simply because of the proximity of people. We can identify cities that, like Edinburgh, are slowly developing this bridging capital. The American sociologist Richard Florida writes of these kinds of cities, of what he calls the diversity advantage of cities that diverse cities are more likely to attract the creative class of people who are themselves cosmopolitan, inventive, artistic, and who are more likely to thrive in a culture of complexity, difference, exchange, and cooperation. Florida studied both old cosmopolitan cities and the cities of today and sees, sees a positive correlation between measures of tolerance and success as cities. It's not only about industry and technology, it's also about tolerance. And in his study, The Rise of the Creative Class, he draws the correlation between economic development and the climate of tolerance that attracts creative talent. It's this kind of city that's likely to have an idea of itself that is a welcoming city where the world gathers, a city with a place for all. As British authors Wood and Landry, who wrote The Intercultural City, put it, there is a need to establish a city vision backed explicitly by the leadership, which emphasizes the welcoming of outsiders, of projecting the city as a world in one place. The, uh, let me close with some words then from the Aga Khan, the spiritual leader of the Ismaili Muslims, who has become a great spokesman for pluralism around the world in our time, has a center for pluralism actually in uh, Toronto. Development in the 21st century, he believes, will require the strengthening and nurturing of pluralist societies. It's my conviction, he writes, that strengthening institutions that support pluralism is as critical for the welfare and progress of human society as alleviating poverty and preventing conflict. In fact, all three are intimately related. But pluralist societies, he says over and over, 
do not happen by themselves. They are the product of enlightened education and continuous investment by government, by citizens, and by civil society in recognizing and celebrating the diversity of the world's peoples. Pluralist societies, pluralist cities, do not happen by themselves. They are the creation of those who deliberately put in place the infrastructure that will support our diversity. And this interfaith infrastructure is surely critical to the urban century and the urban future ahead. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Um, hello, sorry, this is kind of more a question from yesterday, but there wasn't really much time for it. Um, I was just wondering um, your views on you and your experience of uh, um, the Ambedkarite movement in India and the Dalit conversion movement. It's a very interesting movement, to be sure. The um, B.R. Ambedkar, for those of you who don't know him, it was a Dalit and untouchable who was really a leader of the, uh, of the untouchable movement and actually kind of an opponent of Gandhi to some extent. The two of them went at it over the issue of whether there should be reservation of uh, seats in the new Indian uh, government for untouchables. And Gandhi's view was the more you underline these divisions of society, the more they will persist. But Ambedkar ba basically won the day. The Ambedkarite movement in India involved uh, eventually bringing a number of uh, untouchables out of Hinduism, you might say, and broadly conceived, and into Buddhism. And that is usually what, it, what is referred to today. It's a kind of Buddhist movement because the Buddhist uh, tradition, beginning with the Buddha himself, never recognized any kind of caste distinction. So it's a fairly active movement. Um, I don't know how vibrant uh, it still is, but I think it is. Do you know anything about it? Um, I'm afraid I don't know a great okay. deal, but I mean, I, I know there's obviously, as, as there always is, there's a split, you know, between various different groups, and there's um, there are people who refuse to believe these folk are. Um, Buddhist, um, they still suffer, suffer a great deal of discrimination and there's obviously yeah. also the um, um, movement to convert to Christianity as well, so I suppose that's related and has similar problems. Yeah, Ambedkar kind of looked around and thought, well now where, which are the religious faiths that are non-discriminatory? And he thought about Sikhs and he thought about Christians and decided on Buddhist as sort of the, one of the old Indic religions. And, um, uh, you know, there, I mean, there have been a lot of movements of Dalits or untouchables out of Hinduism and into other faiths, uh, and Christians, that goes for Christians as well. Um, uh, yes. Yes, um, I hope I understood correctly, but um, I understand that you are saying that people should get together and know each other better. And then That's they would get... That's certainly a start, yes. And then <laughs> they would get on. Uh, um, possibly, yes. So, <laughs> what I'm wondering is whether you would also agree that it, would, it is very important to be aware of history and the wounds of history from the past. So, if you meet someone from another race or another, let alone our own race, but from another race or another religion, one is aware and maybe one's actions would ameliorate the situation in some way or you could help to heal that. That's my... I'm just asking. Very true. I mean, we do not start as human beings sort of de novo in the present. We carry a lot of history from the past. And, uh, you know, I think each of us can think of the ways in which our own religious tradition carries that history in relation to, and to particular conflicts, uh, times of oppression and being oppressed, uh, times of war. Uh, making war with others, and that doesn't go away. I mean, we, you know, there's something really true about this notion of karma that we carry the traces of the past with us, 
and yet they're not totally determinative. So we also need to look toward the future and toward the freshness of the future. There are ways in the United States, just to give an example, in which Hindu and Muslim students who are born in America of South Asian origin really do not carry with them the kinds of uh, scars and battles that their parents and grandparents might have. People who have lived through the partition or people who you know, have uh, some of the communal uh, tension of India in their bones. Their children don't have that, and that's fine. <laughs> they, they don't want to go back and relive the, the, uh, the wars of the past. And you know, they're very much engaged with one another. I'd like to thank you, Professor, for another stimulating lecture. I, I should say that uh, you've come to the right place to make today's lecture because um, you mentioned, I was very pleased to hear your mention of Lewis Mumford, but of course Mumford was a disciple of Pat, the great Scottish uh, genius uh, and, and town planner and, and reformer uh, uh, Patrick Geddes. Yes. Uh, and um, a lot of the ideas uh, that uh, Mumford took on were, were, were Gadesian ideas. And nowadays, uh, in, in the, 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 the um, struggle between globalization and localization, Geddes is a very, very important person, and, and his ideas are, are badly needed. Uh, can I um, mention also that um, the, the idea of the city as a place of struggle, of, of contention, of exploitation, is, is, is probably the dark side of, 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 of your lecture. You're, you're an optimist, clearly, and um, it's good to hear the, an optimist speaking, because there's an awful lot on the other side that's dark and, and, and not palatable. I'd like to quote to you something. It's from a biography of, of the writer of Revelation, John of Patmos. A John of Patmos was familiar with Babylon, which was the economics of the Roman Empire, and it was said of him that um, at that time cities had expanded to the point that they could not sustain themselves without receiving huge inward transfers of food. This resulted in the creation of latifundia, extensive estates, which were an early example of agribusiness. This process drove peasants off the land. It consolidated the land in the hands of wealthy, often um, absentee landowners, it damaged subsistence farming as a way of life, it swelled the cities with grossly inflated populations, living in appallingly unhygienic conditions, with no sewerage or water supply, it caused epidemics of disease, poverty and despair. It produced hideous disparities between rich and poor and set up horrendous social tensions. And the authors conclude the ancient city was not a pretty place. Yeah. Fast forward 2,000 years, yeah. and nothing much has changed, <laughs> except it may have got better <laughs> in some respects, but worse in others. Um, but can I mention, finally, uh, the, the, there's, uh, the, on, on the religious aspects of this, um, obviously um, what John of Patmos was wanting was a complete revolution in society. The, in other words, overthrow the Roman Empire and have a new society ba based on a, a, a Christian, common, a godly commonwealth. Uh, now, the, 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 there are writers who have espoused this. Uh, you haven't mentioned Mike Davis, author of... Um, I'm going to have to get your notes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I get to write this into a longer lecture, no, 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 so we may need your I'm, I'm, footnotes please, here. Please allow me five. I, I think we need to give her a chance to respond. And, and let yes. Other, let I, other people join the conversation. I, I'd, I'd like to quote what, from Mike Davis and ask for your comments on, on, on these two quotations. The, 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 Mike Davis says that um, the vision of the future is one of urban implosion or involution. The labor power of a billion people has been expelled from the world system, and who can imagine any plausible scenario under neoliberal auspices that would in reintegrate them as productive workers or mass consumers? Now that surely must be the problem, that there's now a billion people, uh, that probably more than that, in, 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 in horrendous situations. In Mumbai, we've seen Slumdog Millionaire. I mean, you only look at the TV and I've seen The Wire. And the states, if you look at the wire, you think, what is happening to the social fabric of the USA? So <laughs> what, what, what do you say? I have to bring you gently back to the politics of all this. What do you say to the politics of this? What do you propose to make things better, better than, than they are? 
Well, this is a really good question. Uh, and I wish I, I wish I ran the world. Be, uh, but, um, you know, there, I mean, you talk about these, the horrendous vision of everything that could go wrong in cities and is going wrong because, you know, cities are, are huge all over the world. The metropolis unbound, some of them like Mexico City are 25 million people. So there are lots of workshop people, uh, one of them based at the London School of uh, Economics, and the, it is a big world urban project. There's the International Metropolis Conference. There are groups that meet regularly and have a huge sort of think tank uh, going on in between about the future of urban centers. And the London Urban Project is an especially interesting one. They've got architects, they've got engineers, they've got people who are interested in transportation and water and food and all of these things engaged in studying how and planning how major cities should develop over the next few years. Uh, they look at Rio, they look at London, they look at Istanbul, they look at Mumbai. But these are the very people who have absolutely no idea about religion. They don't even think about religion and religious communities and the moral fabric of the cities that they're studying. Or what it is that religious communities might contribute to the bridging capital, or the social capital of a city. And in a way, to me, this is one of the deepest divides, the divide between people who uh, are active in and studying uh, religious communities people like many of yourselves, uh, and people who go about the planning of things, who you know, are old socialists, a lot of them, and they don't, they don't really study uh, religion. They don't think about it in their intellectual conspectus. So you've nailed some important issues. Thank you. Jeanneau Pouchon. I'd like you to pursue that for a minute. Do you think there is, though, at all a danger that in so-called faiths coming together, those very faiths are constructed in another way or in a more divisive way and also bringing all those within them into a kind of homogeneity that they maybe never had before. Yeah. I mean, I wonder how many of those Somali taxi drivers actually bothered or thought about the problem or thought there was ever a problem in anybody bringing alcohol, except for the fact that suddenly this consciousness of being Muslim had been raised, um, and then everybody was supposed to toe the line, and it became a platform for identity in all kinds of ways which are actually pretty divisive. It's a very good question, because uh, it is, I mean, this is why I think starting with the local is a little bit more helpful, because at the local level, one does see some of the Nuance. It's not that everything is is kind of ironed out, um, and so the groups that might participate in the, you know, a local inter-religious council or event are, are are whoever is there, and if it's a particular Hindu community from the Caribbean, uh, that that's who's there. <laughs> Uh, they don't, you know, they're, it's not, they're not representing Hinduism or something. Um, as for the Somalis, the interesting thing is it was their own sort of construction of faith that, that brought about this kind of resistance to carrying alcohol. Other people turned around and said, why are you people resisting carrying alcohol? The taxi drivers in Cairo do it all the time. Uh, and the taxi drivers in New York, the Muslim taxi drivers in New York, they don't, they don't uh, resist this, so what is the deal? And so there were people trying to weigh in from a sort of more pan-Islamic point of view and say, really, if you look at Sharia, it, uh, it, it, you, know, you have to balance this thing and that thing, and it's all right to earn your living by transporting people who have alcohol. But it was the Somalis themselves who had this resistance. And of course, in the United States, you can't necessarily say, well, someone else says that your faith really does permit this, because it's the scruples of your own conscience that have a status before the law. So it didn't matter if some other Muslim group said it was OK. I mean, it's a good question. I think sometimes that interfaith things do kind of iron 
iron out differences and you know all we have is the the um, the the rabbi or the swami standing there representing a whole range of people who would never acknowledge themselves to be represented by that person uh, so it, it will cut both ways but we have one more question here at the front yes mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your stimulating address. But when you say that um, activity begins at the local level, but for a dialogue to take place, there's got to be a, a language which is understood by the people participating. And in my experience of a dialogue at the local level of religious discourse, we're still dealing with an 18th century metaphor, metaphor which has no resonance with a secular scientific society. What's your comment on the need for religion to develop a language which is understood in a secular society? Well, it is important, and you know, in every religious tradition, people do develop, and some people are sort of more in command of that language than others. Um, it's not absolutely necessary for a, a dialogue to begin, to begin by talking about the relationship of one's own faith to a secular and scientific world in which we live. People struggle with that uh, at all levels. I mean, I'm as a United Methodist, I, you know, I know that there are people in my church who are just as modern as I in some ways, but who don't really speak the language of a secular scientific society and you know for whom the great stories of Christianity are just that the stories by which they live and live their lives and die their deaths and so i think we don't need to begin with a kind of deconstruction of our stories <laughs> in order to get to know each other, some, uh, uh, if that's your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.